What a pleasure to be here with you in this ocean country and to be celebrating the 15th anniversary of the National Geographic's publication and the 5th anniversary of Google Maps. For me, it's additionally special that we're in a way celebrating a fourth anniversary, four years, four years, <laughs> for another aspect of Google Earth that I particularly love, and that's the ocean in Google Earth. I have a particular story about that. You'll hear more in a moment. But four years ago, I was attending a conference in Spain and had a chance to uh, actually, it was more than four years ago, it was 2006 actually, that I was at a conference where I had 15 minutes to talk about why the ocean matters. It was an audience felt like this. Part of my remarks had to do with the importance of getting to know the, the nature of the ocean from the inside out. And then I saw, sitting near the front of the auditorium, John Hankey, who is the person who is the head of Google Earth. And I had just this inspiration. I said, John, I didn't know it was John, I knew it was Mr. Hankey at the time. How much I love Google Earth that I can hold it, and anyone can hold the world in your hands. And I said, my children love it, my grandchildren love it. And then it just struck me. I just, just popped out and said, but someday you should finish Google Earth, because something's missing. It's the ocean. At the time, the ocean was a big blob of blue. You couldn't see beneath the surface. You could go to find your hometown. You could see your backyard. You could go find Starbucks. But you couldn't see the ocean, at least anything in the ocean. I actually did say, you should call Google Earth Google Dirt, because where's the, where's the water? Great job with the land, but we're not the ocean. So John Hankey could have been um, upset, but he wasn't. He invited me to go to the Googleplex to meet with the Googlers and to do recommendations about what it would take to make the world whole. So I now want to introduce to you John Hankey, who will take you to the now whole Google Earth. <laughs> yes, I don't know how that comes through in translation, but Sylvia really did say it should be called Google Dirt. Not Google Earth, she said Google Dirt, because you left out the most important part of the planet. <clears throat> so, I don't have enough hands to do that. Can I just go here? <laughs> okay. um, so Sylvia wanted me to come and show you a little bit about what we've been doing with Google Earth as we talk about the oceans this evening and some of the oceans issues. So um, I began working with some technologists that came from a company called Silicon Graphics about 10 years ago to try to create a new kind of map on a personal computer. And we're going to show it to you. Here we go. to create a new kind of map on a personal computer that took satellite imagery and readings of the altimetry of the heights of the mountains around the world and all of the information that we could gather that would make a, a map that anyone could access, that children could access from school, that would depict the entire Earth. And uh, as Sylvia said, I was happily going around and showing people this creation that we had made. And here you're seeing Grand Canyon one of the first places that we modeled in 3D. 
from above. You can go down. We're very proud of some of these little features. You can control the time of day, so you can make stars come out at night. We've also uh, incorporated photographs from people. So you'll see these little blue dots all around. So these are photographs that individuals have taken on vacation when they're exploring the world on their own personal travels and uploaded. And we include those in Google Earth to enrich the uh, experience. Some of these photos are very special. They can include, in fact, billions of pixels of, of resolution. We call these gigapixel photos. And we can fly into these in Google Earth. And these can be very beautiful and can contain a lot of detail. In fact, you just keep zooming in into this picture. And, you know, I have three children, a 12-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 3-year-old. And I love the fact that kids in schools around the world can go to these places that are so remote and experience them. So this is the very top of Mount Everest. And we have a very nice interview here. And we can explore and fly around. It's a little bit easier to do this in Google Earth than to actually hike there. But Sylvia reminded us um, at this conference that even though we thought we had created this masterpiece, that we were in fact missing two thirds of the planet. That it really wasn't a good idea to show school children the world and to not include any information about the oceans. I mean, what are children supposed to think if the ocean is just one blue pixel that doesn't show the diversity, that doesn't show, the, that doesn't map out the interesting terrain to show the diversity of life that lives there, to show children that this is, this is not just a place for us to dump our garbage or to extract oil from, but it's a really important part of the planet that we have to think about and protect. So we started working on filling out the blue parts. And you can see just a glimpse of this. This is just off the big island in Hawaii. And in fact, I've learned a lot about this from Sylvia. If we dive down here, this is actually an undersea volcano. And in Google Earth, we sprinkled little bits of photos and videos so that as people are browsing around and flying around to these places, they can learn about what they're seeing. In fact, there's a lot of detailed information here that shows this video from this volcano under the ocean just forming the next island in a way. You can actually see the minerals seeping out here um, deep in the ocean. Um, we, didn't, um, we didn't want to just show geography, but we also wanted to show the life that lives in the oceans. So you'll find um, the ocean is sprinkled with photos and videos that we hope will give kids a sense of a great diversity and fascinating kinds of creatures that live Monterey Bay 
understanding. And Google Earth lets us explore it. And I'll let this just sort of fly us underneath the surface. And we can get a sense of this really amazing geographic future. The thing that I'm most excited about is that Google Earth is a free product that any child anywhere in the world can experience if they can get access to a, a computer or today even a, an iPhone or a mobile phone. So all this was missing before Sylvia kind of prodded us to fill in the blue parts. Um, we worked with um, some folks at the Monterey Bay um, Aquarium and Research Institute who helped us fill out lots of interesting detail about the creatures that live um, in these waters. I think that the blue whale is one of the most amazing things that exists on this earth. And uh, there's some great footage here that's depicting the songs the sounds made by the whales. Looks like the wonderful internet is letting us down a little bit. This is Wild Honest is a National Geographic Production. Our oceans are alive with sound. Sound that most of us never hear. There's one man who's definitely listening hard. John Kalamokitas studies blue whales as a senior research biologist at the nonprofit group Cascadia Research. So I won't play all of that. There are actually hundreds of these video clips that we've been able to, um, to add um, all over the world. Let's go over to Japan. So one of the groups that we worked with and put this together is a group called Archive. Archive works with the very best video uh, videographers and photographers around the world, including those from National Geographic as well as the BBC, and it collects photographs and images of the world's endangered species. So this layer puts in Google Earth the habitat they occupy, um, the endangered species of both the land and the ocean. Again, so that as kids are exploring these interesting, fun diversions, they can begin to learn about um, what's at risk. Um, and there are a lot of things that are just interesting from a historical point of view. Um, this particular video is about the fleet of, of Kublai Khan that attempted to invade Japan, but was hurled against the coast in a storm and sank. It appears that this ship had water tight compartments. It was an exceptionally well-developed shipbuilding technology. A technology that had it been exploited might have conquered the rest of the world, but instead was squandered on the shores of Japan. So I don't know about you, but I think the ocean's a pretty interesting place. And I'm awfully glad that Sylvia pushed us to, to finish this part of our product. Now we've also been working um, with a partner here in Japan to help extend the mapping of information about the oceans around the islands of Japan and the life that lives there. Uh, some fantastic um, data is, is collected by um, some of the best marine technology in the world. These are just some of the photos uh, that have been collected uh, by James Tech. Many of them courtesy of a, an amazing piece of technology, the world's deepest diving scientific submarine. And I want to call on stage uh, our special guest from Jamstack to tell you guys a little bit more about what happens there and how they do this. And I'm just going to start this tour playing, and you should take over.
slight technical problem. <laughs> it jumps to get that guy is. We're on our way at warp speed. Is that? Okay. Eh, to Google Earth Ocean の中でですね。えっと、ジャムステックの深海六千五百のえー、ツアーをですね、えー、現在デモで作られてるんですけれども、まあ、その中で実際にその深海で潜っていく風景というか、えー、そのオペレーション自体を体験できるようなあの紹介のされ方をしていると思いますけれども。えー、これが深海6500で潜っていく時の感じなんですけれども、ねまあ、今回は沖縄の鳩間海域というところに潜っていくところのビデオというかあれを CD で再現しているんですけれどもあのこれがジャムスティックの心の有人性の推定深海6500です、えー、このようにですね海面から潜り始めまして実はかなりリアルに作られてまして深海6500というのは沖縄進行していくとき、潜っていくとき、このようにですね、ぐるぐる回りながら、あ、進行していくってことです。今見ましたのは銀座、えー、こういうふうにして潜っていくときに、ね、いろんなその深海で見られる魚だと、えー、こういうふうに紹介されてるんですけれども、まあ実は僕はあの生物学者じゃないあんまり詳しくないんですけど、あの銀座ですこれは、えー、こういうふうに潜りながらいろんなもの、これはあビクニと呼ばれる魚の一種です。でこれは A ですけれども、えー、6つのエラーを持っている A というものです。でこのようにです、ね、潜っていく途中にです、ね、いろんなその生物と出会うということで、えーまあ、潜っている体験をしながらです、ねえー、その深海で見られるような生物を紹介していくというようなあグラフィックスになります。これ、ほほほほほきほほきかいほっきがいやっときな。ちょっとちょっとです。スポンジです。スポンジが現れました。えー、このようにどんどんどんどん海底が近づいてくるとですね。まあこのハトマ海底というのは熱水のところにもえっ、ー、と海面の石ですけれども、えー、これ U M A でアンアイデンティファイミステリアスアニマル名前についてない、えー、未確認の生物。まあたくさん見られるんですけど、えー、これは熱水のところを今登ろうとしているツアーを再現しているわけですけれども、あのー、もうすぐすると。熱水の近くにいるような生物が現れていくると、まあ、日本近海の熱水の生物って特徴的なのがたくさんですけど、まあ、潜っている時にこれは限りなビクニンの後ろ姿とかこういうふうにして熱水の近くにはすごくマリンスノーが多くてですね、えー、きれいなんですけれどもあようやく熱水が出てきましたけれども、えー、日本近海の熱水の特徴であるその五右衛門星を入りとかですね深海ひばり貝のお花畑というのもこういうふうにして、えー見せておりますえー、あれはあの食べるカニとよく似たイバラガニですけれどもまあ美味しくはないと思いますけれどもいいですあおはらえると呼ばれるこれはあの食用のエビで美味しいエビ進化にいますあそこに見えてますけれどもああいうふうに火山のような地形になって実際はその中に入っていくわけですが、まあ、残念ながらそこまであの詳細には再現できませんけれども腰をあるいはこれ不発弾のように見えますけれどもあのチームに呼ばれる、えー下から出てくる、まあ、水によってです、ね、作られる煙突状の構造なんかも示しています実際にこういう深海の画像の、えー、と深海6500というところに見られるということは非常に、えー、楽しくて、えー、ぜひ、えー、これをアップされたらです、ね、皆さんもあの見ていただきたいと思うんですけれども、まあ、一応あのツアーをしようと思うので。I finish. <laughs> <laughs>
And in fact, the Gulf of Mexico is actually teeming with uh, fascinating large and small sea creatures. Um, and unfortunately, um, as you guys know, uh, many of them are now at risk because of the disaster that has unfolded there. Um, at Google, um, as this began happening, one of the things that um, people on my team were able to do is to obtain images and data from NOAA and from NASA and other sources and distribute to the public um, information about the extent of this spill to help educate people and motivate people to um, try to do something about it. Um, and I'm having some, a little bit of difficulty in this particular area to, uh, to turn on, but Sylvia, we've got some fantastic images I may want to show, so why don't you come on stage and take over and um, tell us a little bit about what's happening. Explorers. In the 1930s, 
zoologist William Beebe, and engineer Otis Plain, descended a thousand meters into the depths around Bermuda for a first view of life in a place the sunlight never reaches. Beebe compared what he saw to the naked space itself, now far beyond atmosphere, between the stars, where the blackness of space, the shining planets, common suns and stars, must really be closely akin to the world of life as it appears to the eyes of an all-human being in the open ocean, one half mile down. For me and Martin, the comets, the suns, and the stars were living creatures reflecting rainbows of iridescence, or flashing, sparkling, and glowing with their own living light. Fireflies and glowworms are famous light makers on the land, but in the deep sea, about 90% of the creatures, jellies, fish, bacteria, shrimp, squids, and many others, have some form of bioluminescence to signal one another. Scientists say these bursts of starlight may be the most common form of communication on the planet. In the open sea, jellies are also among the most abundant forms of life. The Gulf Stream Current can carry these oddly beautiful drifters along at about 160 kilometers a day. Buffered by the Gulf Stream is a magically quiet, gently rotating mass of sargasso weed that expands over more than 5 million square kilometers of open waters. Isolated by the walls of fast moving currents between Bermuda and Puerto Rico, the Sargasso Sea holds a liquid jungle of creatures which have evolved over the ages to exist in floating forests of golden brown sargasso. Within its leafy, sunlit masses are camouflaged such creatures as loggerhead turtles, filefish, sea hares, and a speckled brown sargasso crab. For scientists, it's a living laboratory, strategically located in the open sea. For creatures that live in the undersea caves, among the reefs, and in the great depths below, Bermuda is simply home. So, we can see images such as this and realize that the ocean is important to little seahorses, to crabs, to other creatures that clearly live in the sea, but in many ways, all of us are sea creatures, because without the ocean, there is no life on Earth. Take away the ocean, and you have a planet, a lot like Mars, a beautiful place, but not very hospitable to life at all. The ocean delivers things that we do take for granted. Most of the oxygen in the atmosphere that we count on comes from the sea. Much of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean and stored there. The ocean regulates temperature, governs climate and weather. Things that we take for granted, or at least we once could take them for granted, but now we realize, beginning to realize, that we humans have the power to actually change the nature of nature, change the nature of the world by altering the chemistry of the ocean, by putting so many noxious things into the sea, and taking so much life out of the sea, we're actually altering the way the ocean works, and therefore the way the world works. And one of the reasons I'm so glad that we now have Google Ocean, Google Earth, is that we can show this to people around the world to show how we are connected, not just to one another, although that's really important, but how we're connected to nature 
and how what we do in the ocean affects all of us everywhere, all of us sea creatures. I first began diving more than 50 years ago. It doesn't seem like a long time ago, geologically speaking. And every time that I dive into the ocean, it's like it's the first time that joy of being able to see the world in a different way, to feel that weightlessness of flying underwater. If you haven't tried diving yet, don't wait until you are as old as my mother was when she began. She was 81. And if you are 81, don't wait any longer. Go jump in. If you're not 81, get started. You still have a lot of time. People ask me sometimes, about twice a week, do you still dive? And I tell them, I still breathe, so I still dive. Of course I do. It's one thing you can do all your life. I get to go to some good wet place outside of the shower or the bath at least once a month. And I wish I could do more. But I can become driven to try to share the thousands of hours of exploring the ocean with people such as you, who you who haven't yet had a chance maybe to see some of the great things I've enjoyed in the course of my life so far, more to come. I've had a chance on nine different occasions to live underwater, to actually sleep with a fish, with little underwater laboratories such as this one that is presently out in the Florida Keys near Miami, Key Largo, in 20 meters of water. You can swim out of the blue hole in the floor day and night and get to know the creatures on a much more intimate basis than it is possible to do when you just visit the fish market or a <laughs> restaurant. I've also had the fun of using little personal submersibles, submarines that you wear like a suit of clothes. They're personal submersibles because there's just one person that fits inside. It's a little bit like diving, except you don't get wet. You capture a volume of air, and you have a system such as astronauts use to recycle air, or rebreather, so you maintain the same pressure underwater that you have at the surface. That means you can go to 1,000 or 2,000, or as with the Shinkai 6,500, to 6,500 meters beneath the surface, and no decompression is required when you come back. It's such a joy to have this kind of passport into the sea. I once imagined that these would become really common, and maybe they will. I like to think there will be Hertz rent a sub, or Avis rent a sub, or whatever it takes, so that anybody can go and on a Saturday afternoon get a little underwater sports car and drive off into the ocean. We need to understand the sea, because, as I point out, we're all sea creatures. We all need the ocean. Now, the ocean needs us to take care of some of the problems that we humans have been causing for the ocean. First, we have to know what's there. And here's the thing. Less than 5% of the ocean has been seen, let alone explored. Over the years, since William Beebe and Otis Barton first had a glimpse of life in the deep sea, as much as one kilometer down, it's been possible to see dozens of little submersibles, some for one person, some for two people, some like this one for three people. The Shinkai 6500 takes three people, and to go explore the depths. I 
hope that there are people in this audience who will get busy and design some new submarines to go to the full ocean depth. It is, after all, only 11 kilometers down. We have airplanes flying. John Hankey and I came to visit here seven miles, 11 kilometers in the sky. But only once have people been to the deepest sea. James had developed a robot that also went to the deepest ocean. And that's in the Mariana Trench off the coast of the Philippines. Unfortunately, that wonderful machine was lost during the storm. And there is now just one other machine developed at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution that can now go for little glimpses of what it is like to the deepest part of the sea. But we still have to have something that will take us down here. We can use our mind, our eyes, our spirit to convey what it's like in the deepest parts of our blue planet. There are very few places that you can go these days where you can see sharks as abundant as where I was in that little three-person submarine off the coast of Costa Rica, the Cocos Islands. This is one of the places I think of as a hope spot, a place that if we protect it now in Costa Rica, the government that has jurisdiction over the Cocos is protecting this part of the ocean and these sharks. But around the world, 90% of the sharks have been taken.
For tuna, a good place to start would be to protect the breeding areas, to those places where they gather to spawn. Unfortunately, in the Atlantic Ocean, one place is right where the deep water horizon oil spill has taken place. It's a setback for tuna. It's a setback for the ocean. It's a setback for those who like to eat tuna because already their numbers are at an alarmingly low level, like sharks. Many of the big fish in the sea are diminished by 90%. The last thing they need is an oil spill in their breeding area. What we can do is identify where these critical areas are and do everything we can to protect them so that we can see a time when recovery might take place. But it's heartbreaking to see how many creatures from the sea are being just turned into commodities. It's hard to replace them faster than we are taking them. This is all new in the last two centuries, since the 1800s and the 1900s, and now into the, into the present century. In the last 50 years, along the latter part of the 20th century, we've had the greatest impact because now we can find creatures in the sea. We have new technologies to extract them from the ocean and send them all over the world. We are not very good, though, about extracting in a way that shows much finesse. We use relatively crude means to scrape the ocean floor with trolls, taking the entire ecosystem. It's rather like using a bulldozer to catch songbirds when the trolls like this are used. You see that mass of life on the deck of the ship. Most of it is simply thrown overboard and not used at all. And this is a very small troll. Some are large enough to engulf 12 jet aircraft side by side. Huge systems that are taking the life of the sea faster than that life can be generated. We're fishing further offshore in deeper water. This is one example off the coast of New Zealand, a creature that was never consumed by people until we could go as deep as they live, a kilometer under the surface around deep sea mountains, whose existence we didn't know about when I was a little girl. But now we can find them, and we can use trawls such as this to catch these creatures that may live to be more than twice as long as humans can live. Some of these creatures, known as orange roughy, can live to be more than two centuries old, 200 years. I'd like to know their secret, but all we know about them, or most of what we know about them, is that they taste really good. We also know that to catch them means destroying corals, deep corals. Most people think of coral reefs in shallow water where there's sunlight, and you can go down with a snorkel and see the coral reefs. But now we know that there are coral reefs in the deep sea where it's dark all the time, where the corals grow so slowly that one like this may be more than 2,000 years old. They are simply taken out of the ocean, discarded, removed so that the nets can more readily get to where the fish are swimming. We know that there are limits to how much water we can take. We almost eliminated some of the great whales as early as the first part of the 20th century. The good news is there's still whales in the ocean because we stopped killing large numbers soon enough. We can do the same with other creatures. We can imagine going into the end of the 21st century with lots of sharks in the sea, with lots of tuna in the ocean, but only if we figure out what the limits are, not to take too many, and to protect the critical areas in the ocean that they require to live. 
That's not all that's wrong with the ocean. What we're putting into the ocean, all the plastics that exist now, that did not exist when I was a little girl, I come from the geological era that I suppose you could call the pre-plasticozoic. Before plastics existed, I was on Earth. So I know we don't absolutely need plastics to survive. Of course, I love them. I love Ziploc bags. I love the shoes that I wear that have plastics. The computer cases, so much that is so useful. But we have to be more careful about what we do with it when it is served us well. Maybe we recycle it. Whatever it is that we do, we shouldn't let it get loose in the ocean. There, it is mistaken for food by birds, like albatrosses, that feed these little bits and pieces of plastic to their young. Thousands, tens of thousands of seabirds die now every year because they get stuffed with plastic when they're still young. They never learn to fly, never live to fly. The discarded fishing gear that goes on fishing and fishing is a big problem. Thousands of marine mammals die this way every year, and birds, and fish that never come to market because they simply die underwater. This is a good news story. It looks terrible. But in fact, this little turtle was found wrapped up in fishing gear, but it was still alive. It was in the Galapagos Islands. I was there when we unwound the plastic and turned it loose. And I hope it's still swimming out there somewhere in the sea. This is good news, too, although it doesn't look like good news. Volunteer students in the summer, like right now, are out in the northwest Hawaiian Islands diving to recover old fishing gear that has been lost at sea, bringing it back where it can be recycled safely instead of continuing to wander through the oceans like ghost fence, killing life along the way. There, have to, there must be better ways to treat the ocean. This picture may be familiar to you, and speaking of better ways to treat the ocean, consider that we have been extracting fossil fuels from the sea for the past 50 years or so. And most of the drilling has been done with relative safety. But all it takes is one major disaster, such as the one recently in the Gulf of Mexico, to remind us that we have to be really careful about the ocean. We are all sea creatures. Now, I'm giving you a preview of what you will see, those of you who subscribe to the National Geographic, and I suppose that's all of you. If you don't, then there's still time so that you can receive the October issue of the National Geographic that has this preview look right now. You are the first audience on the planet outside of the National Geographic to see the images I'm about to share with you. Some of the best photographers in the world were out there in the Gulf of Mexico to record forever images so that we will never forget our capacity to harm the ocean. We have the power to destroy. We also have the power to protect. This is a scene after dispersants, more than 2 million gallons, or about 2 million gallons, of dispersants were used to cause the oil to break up into smaller pieces and therefore be spread more widely into the sea. Some of us, I was among those who said this is a really bad idea. What we want to do when oil is spilled is to gather it together, take it out of the ocean, not break it into small pieces and send it further into the sea. Now we have a magnified problem with columns of little 
droplets of oil extend over much wider distances. Remember, the oil starts at the bottom of the ocean at a depth of 1.6 kilometers down, 5,000 feet. When the oil comes out, it's really hot. It hits cold water and it breaks all by itself into small pieces. Some comes to the surface. Some goes into marshes that are already in trouble because of the sea level rise brought about by excess carbon dioxide warming the planet faster than it has been normally the case. And these great canals cut across the marshes, causing salt water to penetrate far into freshwater systems. This has become a sea of despair. What we hope will emerge are reasons for hope for the pelicans and other birds that received a death sentence. The little crabs. All of these creatures. But the people of goodwill responding, catching these creatures that were slathered with oil and doing what they could to bring them back to health. It's a daunting task once the oil is loose and further when it is spread widely into the sea. The sea and the people and the animals all share a common sense of despair. Look closely at this image. It's a stunning view of what happened, what we're doing to our life support system through careless activities that could be prevented. And it's a reminder that we really must look for alternatives to fossil fuels that generate the carbon dioxide in excess that are causing not just the problems of the sort that you see here, but the kinds of things that are more difficult to see. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that are driving issues beyond just oil spills. Or this image. This is a big problem. Millions of gallons of toxic oil, millions of gallons of toxic dispersants poured into the living ocean. Scenes such as this are jarring. People who love to just enjoy the coast met by those in heavy suits out trying to save what they can of the wildlife that's stranded there. In the ocean, this is a sample of what the plankton looks like. Those small creatures that are food for much of the life at sea, the bottom of the food chain. Sunlight strikes the ocean, causes microscopic photosynthetic green and blue-green organisms to start the food chain, generating oxygen, fixing carbon, feeding these little crustaceans, these little arrowworms, the whole spectrum of life that you see in a cross-section of the ocean. But this is what happens when oil and dispersants are applied. These small creatures are able to engulf these tiny droplets of oil, not good for the health of the little crustaceans, not good for the health of the creatures that eat them, not good for the health of the ocean, not good for us. Our demand for fossil fuels, of course, is what drives such things as the big spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Many people are blaming BP. But we should hold up the mirror and say, what are we doing? Drilling on ancient forests, ancient life transformed into oil and gas and coal, and draining down these ancient assets in a few decades, creating carbon dioxide, warming the planet, also acidifying the ocean. This is the time, because now we understand. We couldn't see these things 50 years ago. 
We certainly couldn't see them a hundred years ago. But now we have the National Geographic, we have Google Earth, we have the means of transmitting knowledge instantly all over the planet to give us a wake-up call to take care of the planet that takes care of us. The loss of ice in the Arctic very rapidly now and increasing every year. This year appears to be the most rapid decline of all, more than that record year of 2007. We should, now that we know, take action. If we don't, can you imagine what the consequences will be? We know. I mean, I can forgive those in the past who didn't take action because they didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the information. They allowed species to go extinct. They destroyed areas in the sea and on the land that we can never recover. But we now see bad news for creatures like polar bears, whose future is very much in doubt. We see coral reefs that once were as beautiful as this. Half of them are in serious trouble as a consequence in part of global warming high temperature, in part because we're efficient, in part because of pollution. All of these things together, they are combined to create problems for our life support system. We, who depend on the ocean as much as the corals that grow there. The good news is, when we protect places in the sea, such as this area, if we restrain the amount of fishing, if we stop dumping noxious things into the sea, there is a chance for recovery. These corals are growing again where they had been dying because efforts were taken to have these sanctuaries, these havens in the sea. We can, actually we must, make a difference with the time that we have. For the first time, we really understand their limits to how much pressure we can put on the world that keeps us alive. Why does it matter? Because our economy depends on it. Why does it matter? Because our health depends on it. Why does it matter? Because our security depends on it. It matters because our life depends on it. These are two of my four grandsons. It matters to me because I think of what the world is going to be like by the middle of the 21st century. Our technology has the capacity to do so many wonderful things. Perhaps the most wonderful thing is that we can communicate to one another at a level, at a scale, that is unprecedented in human history. We can find answers. We can find solutions now that we know we have problems. So that when these children of today reach the middle of the 20th century, 21st century, they won't look back at us here at the start of the 21st century and say, why did you not do something? Because you knew we had some problems and you didn't use your good minds, your good technology to find solutions. Or they might celebrate and salute us for being so smart, so wise, that while there still were 10% of the sharks, there were still some tunas, still some whales, still some coral reefs, that we did everything we could to protect them. And I want to show you right now the last little piece, just three minutes, of reasons for hope in the Gulf of Mexico. Because a few weeks ago, I went out to the Gulf, and I went diving with a scientist from the University of Southern Mississippi who has been studying the biggest fish in the sea, whale sharks. Not whales, they're sharks, but they're as big as the big whales. They're as big as a bus. They're beautiful animals. I saw my first whale shark in the Osaka Aquarium. One of the reasons that I love aquariums is that they can bring creatures such as whale sharks to all of us, those of us those of you who don't have a chance, such as I have had, to be out in the ocean, swimming with a hundred of these creatures all at once. 
In the Osaka Court and in a few places in the world, you can see these creatures face to face without going into the big aquarium, the ocean. But fortunately, there are some still out in the sea. I was worried, and so was my colleague, a scientist who studies whale sharks, that because they were only a short distance from where the deep water horizon gushing oil was taking place, that they, a place where they had been seen last year, might be in big trouble, serious trouble. But the whale sharks were fortunate, and so was I, because the currents were moving this mass of oil toward the east. And the place where the whale sharks gather off the coast of the Mississippi and Louisiana is a little bit west of the, this area. So let me take you there. Imagine that you get to the jump in the water with a hundred of these great animals and see them while they're doing what they love to do about as much as they love to do anything, and that is to eat. Oh, one more moment. But the reason we're here for this glimpse of what's happening in the Gulf is to try and find and tag some of the really big guys, the wheel sharks. Now these animals are in this region to feed. The area the wolf still is, is an important feeding area for them. It's essential habitat. And right now, we don't know how they're responding to this oil. It's an ocean full of wheel sharks. I can't even count the number of things. As soon as I think I have a number, it's very more popular. We need to start tagging these guys and looking at their movements in relation to the oil to determine if indeed they are avoided to stay away, or if they are actually going into it and, and succumbing to the oil. What's up, man? How does that work? The Louisiana crunch? I called him Samson because he was the biggest one. He was the magnet. He was the big boy of the bunch. Two of those tags are spot tags. So they're, they're surface satellite tags. So the first thing we want to do is get online, let's see how they're reporting, how often they're reporting, and all that. So hopefully we'll have hits from the day. As long as the satellite has to be overhead, it comes overhead you know, three to six times a day. As long as those two things line up, it will send a signal. And it'll say, here I am. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they, what happens if they encounter that world, where they go with it, you know? The comment that some of them said about the whale sharks in the Gulf of Mexico, the terrible death row, it could be true. It could be that because of their feeding habits, they scale right at the surface where the oil accumulates. They're in harm's way. But the good news is that as far as we know as of today, there are oil sharks still free of oil. There's bad news for a lot of creatures in the Gulf. But we now understand the size of the problem is the first step toward trying to solve that problem. And one move involves trying to establish a network of some of the best places that remain in the Gulf of Mexico to serve as sources of renewal, of restoration, havens where creatures such as whale sharks and others can recover and rebound. It's a recipe for what we should be able to do for the whole world to think about what we can do while we still have time to establish these protected areas, to give life back to the sea, to give life back to us. Thank you for coming and listening.